now. Hello, welcome everyone uh, to the second Cloud Native Portland uh, Brown Bag online meetup, um, where we are going to talk about Crustlet. Um, before we get started, uh, we are going, let me have a few announcements, uh, mostly about Cloud Native Portland and things going on in the Kubernetes and Portland communities. Um, first thing is we have another one of these scheduled for later in the month. Um, if you look on either um, our meetup.com group um, or I on uh, the ZM URL links for us, um, and I will post both of those links in the chat, um, we have another one of these on May 19th. Um, and in this one, I, somebody from Citrix will be talking about uh, proxying strategies for Kubernetes clusters, something that they know very well. Um, the, um, so that's the next one coming up. We don't have another one scheduled beyond that. Um, I think it's actually quite likely that a lot of us will be still subject to stay at home. And certainly I know that Portland will still be banning large gatherings in June. Um, so I am looking for additional speakers for June. So if anybody on the call is or knows somebody um, who could present something, um, as always, the most popular topics among our meetup people are security, CI, CD, um, development tools, um, and networking. So, um, you know, but any topic related to cloud native stuff is welcome. Uh, this is an official meetup of the CNCF. Um, I, as such, uh, we are subject to the CNCF code of conduct. The theme of which is be excellent to each other. Um, uh, so please do keep that in mind when asking your questions or having discussion. Um, other upcoming things, uh, the Kubernetes Community Day for Portland, originally scheduled for September 12th, has been postponed to some indefinite date in early 2021. Um, we don't have sufficient confidence that we will be allowed to have large events um, in September in Portland and that the OCC will be open. Um, so we postponed it before we had to pay a lot of deposits on things that we can't get back. Um, I, there will be a date posted for that sometime later. Uh, right now, our host puppet, um, all of their employees are stay at home and so they're not able to schedule things. Um, uh, similarly, uh, KubeCon Amsterdam um, has been, um, do, 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 KubeCon Amsterdam, that's interesting, has been, turned into a virtual event. Um, details on that will be forthcoming from uh, the uh, KubeCon. If you were not planning to go to Amsterdam, if you were not going to get to go to Amsterdam, uh, as true as probably most of the people on this call, this is actually a good thing for you because it means that you can see a lot of these talks that you would not have otherwise gotten to see um, by registering for KubeCon Amsterdam, which I believe the virtual event will be much cheaper then the in-person event was going to be possibly free. I don't, again, details TBD. Um, this does mean though that the Contributor Summit for Amsterdam uh, has in fact been canceled. Um, after some discussion, the Contributor Summit Committee decided that we are going to have a series of SIG-driven office hours events instead of the standard Contributor Summit format. Um, and the only Contributor Summit this year will be in Boston in November, hopefully. So with all of that, um, I would like to introduce um, our speaker. Taylor, you want to speak up? Yeah, I'm going to give you? myself a longer introduction here when I start the talk. Okay, Okay. I'm well, then I, will, I will keep it short. Taylor Thomas is going to talk to us about Crustlet, which is awesome. Uh, this is something I have been curious about since the project was first announced. Um, very, very interested, both from perspective of cool things you can do with Rust um, and from perspective of, hey, let's rewrite the kubelet, um, which is one of our frustiest pieces of code in Kubernetes. Um, and, and thus, a lot of us are interested in uh, rewrites there. Um, so 
Um, given that, Taylor, do you want to take it away? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take it away and start sharing things. Um, just a note for people, when I'm in presentation mode, it makes it really hard for me to see chat or anything else. So when we uh, do have questions, feel free to just pipe up and, and ask them verbally or uh, chat them and then Josh said he'll, he'll be monitoring the chat and um, read those out loud. So let me go ahead and share things. Okay, so um, as you probably saw when you got the invite, the name of this is the uh, Rusty Boat. As I said, my name is Taylor Thomas, um, and I'm going to be your cruise director today on this wonderfully rusty boat. Um, so let's go ahead and, and just first go through the introduction. So who am I? Um, I'm, I'm currently a, a senior software engineer at Microsoft um, in Microsoft Azure. I am uh, a Helm uh, core maintainer. So I've been doing that for a long time. And just for some reference here, I've been doing Kubernetes since about 1.2 and Docker since like 0 0.7. So I've been, I, I'm very old in container years, uh, as we like to sometimes say. Um, I'm a fairly new Restation, which is the uh, Rust equivalent of a gopher. Um, and so I uh, really have been enjoying Rust and doing some things with that recently. Here are my social media handles if you want to reach out to me on GitHub or Twitter. Um, or on the Kubernetes Slack. And I have my Twitter handle in the lower right hand corner of all the slides so that if you are a live tweeting kind of person, you can live tweet. So um, just some other info about me if you missed when I first started. I actually used to be up in Portland, um, probably met many of you. Um, I am living in Utah. One of the things I love about it is I have multiple mountains instead of a single mountain that everybody likes to go to. So um, I've been enjoying that quite a bit. And like I said, I've been doing this cloud native stuff for quite a while. So hopefully it gives you some confidence that I'm not just making this stuff up or pulling it out of nowhere. Um, so let's go ahead and go through the agenda for today. I'm just gonna call this the deck map. I know I'm leaning into the title a little too much here, but we're gonna, go, we're gonna call this agenda um, the, deck, the, the deck map. So um, first off, we're gonna start off in the crow's nest. So we're gonna get the bird's eye view of the context that's surrounding everything here. Like why, why were we doing this? Like what are the technologies involved? Um, and then we'll go ahead and check in at the pool deck and get our feet wet um, with an intro of Crestlet and Wasm and, and everything that we're, we're doing inside of the actual project. After that, we'll go down to this entertainment district for a show, which I'll just be calling my demos. And then to finish up the tour, we're going to visit the engine room and see how the whole thing works. So we're gonna go over why we used Rust, um, what, um, how it works with Kubernetes and a lot of the technical details around that. Um, like I said, feel free to stop and stop me and ask questions. Um, if I can answer it then, I'll answer it right then. If not, I might say, oh, we're gonna answer that later. So let's go ahead and um, talk about the crow's nest, this, this whole like wide view of everything that's going on. So, um, I, this is where I wish we were in person. I could see how many of you have heard of it, but I'm assuming at least some of you have heard of WASM, um, which is just a short uh, hand for WebAssembly. So WebAssembly, or these, this WASM is a compiled binary that can be run in a browser through JavaScript. They can be imported as modules. And so basically it, Im, it improves the speed and performance um, of things because it's basically compiled code that you're able to run in a browser. But one of the interesting things is a lot of people don't know that you can actually run Wasm outside of the browser, and that's where something called WASI comes in. So just to keep throwing all the acronyms at you, um, WASI stands for WebAssembly System Interface. It has a landing page right there, and I'll send out these slides. That it's an actual link you can click through. Um, but the, the WebAssembly System Interface is meant to be this standard um, thing that everything can compile against. So no matter which operating system you're running on, um, you, can, you can run that module without recompiling it to something else. And so um, that's the, these are things like how do, I, how do I interact with files and how do I print things and how do, all, those, all those kind of little details that, we, that are just kind of managed by most programming languages. This is that interface that it compiles against. Um, and that last bullet point there, it is very new. And when I say very new, I really mean it. There's tons of things that are still missing and not fully um, fully developed out yet. Things like networking don't, don't exist yet in WASI. Um, they, they're working on it, but it's not quite there yet. So just something to, to keep in mind um, when we're talking about WASI, that's what it is. So this WASI is what enables you to run a WebAssembly module, so the compiled code, in um, a non-browser context. So just to uh, throw things in there and say, like that I mentioned there's way too many acronyms here, I'm going to throw out more TLAs or three-letter acronyms. So we have OCI, CRI, and oh my, 
There's all these different things. So um, hopefully everyone here knows that Kubernetes runs containers. Um, but when you actually look at it, there's various levels of abstraction about how we run those containers. Did somebody have a question? Okay. Um, so the, the first thing here is OCI. So we don't really have a good name for this is, uh, because there's actually multiple components to this, but OCI is the Open Container Initiative. And it's a specification that has to do with all things containers. Um, you know, I, I kind of had to group everything under this. These are things like Containerd, Docker, um, and the different shims that run underneath. So on the actual node in Kubernetes, you're running a container using Docker, Containerd, or, or any of those systems um, using some sort of shim process that goes out and spins up the container and keeps track of it. So that's kind of the lowest level where, the, where these containers are actually created. Um, the next level of abstraction is the CRI, or the Container Runtime Interface. Sometimes when we got frustrated, we'd say it was cry. Um, but basically, uh, it's an API that's um, defined in gRPC, and that's a protobuf protocol, if you've never heard of a, um, if you've never heard of gRPC before, but it's an API defined by Kubernetes, and all the different container runtimes implement that. You have cryo, you have container D, you have a bunch of different um, options for your runtime. Um, so uh, you have to implement basically every single thing that's there for it to be able to work with Kubernetes. Now, the next level of abstraction isn't one that's like actually part of core Kubernetes, but it's something that's been done before. It's called Virtual Kubelet. Um, Virtual Kubelet is a project that started at Microsoft, but has evolved into a big community project that um, allows you to implement any um, sort of provider. Um, it acts as a, as a kubelet and acts like it's a node, even though it might not actually be handling a, a VM or some node resource. Um, it uses things like Fargate. There's a Fargate provider that um, makes a pod be just a container inside of Fargate. There's one for Azure Container Instances. Um, and there, I think there's even one for Nomad. Um, there, there's a whole list of them. So it's kind of just this abstraction where it's just saying, I'm pretending to be a node, but I'm running something else underneath. So Crustlet <clears throat> is actually at this abstraction level of virtual kubelet. We, we took a lot of uh, inspiration from virtual kubelet when we created this. Um, because we did investigations on each of these things. We actually tried, we did some investigation on the OCI part, like building a shim, and that was very low level, and we would have ended up having to basically create a process per container. Um, we also tried to, imp we actually tried implementing CRI, but it makes so many assumptions that everything you do is with Docker containers, and so it was really hard to, we were basically ignoring half the interface. There was no way to reuse the, the conformance tests, and so we decided that the best option would be to create just something that says, we're going to pretend to be a node, and then we have the flexibility to do whatever we want. Because all you have to do is listen for new pods that are scheduled to the node, and then you have to be able to report out statuses. So it's a pretty simple interface. So with that said, well, why did we make all this? Like, what was the point? Um, so there's five main points about why, why we decided to go down this path of doing a, a new, um, a new, a new kubelet in Rust and um, why we're using Wasm. So the first thing is this um, security. Uh, Wasm is by default a completely sandboxed model. You cannot do something in Wasm unless you explicitly grant permission to it. It's not running with like a subset of the kernel. You're not, you're not running in like a C group process. It's you have to grant everything that you want to it specifically to, to the module when you run it. So that gives it quite a bit of security. There's also this idea of density. Um, because each WASM module is just running as a, uh, essentially just what's a, a Go routine, if you're familiar with Go, it's running on what's called a future in Rust. Um, these, these things are very lightweight. If, some, if a process is not doing something, it just gets parked and won't take up very much, um, very much memory or CPU because it's just parked off to the side until it needs to work again. Um, now the other things here, so more control, what, I, what I'm referring to more con with more control is that what I was talking about with CRI. We weren't using about half of CRI and that was made it really hard to test. Um, like people will often come in and when they start looking at the project, they ask us, well, why do we choose to do this over like CRI? Um, this model gives us that flexibility that we need. Um, but if something like a CRI V2 comes along that considers something beyond containers, then that's something we might move to if that's where, where people think the, the more stable interface would be. Um, the other thing we are shooting for is this actually run everywhere. 
Um, these last two points are really focused on the WASM side of things. So um, WASM has some security benefits and Rust has some awesome security benefits that I'll talk about later, but these last two points are particularly around WASM. Um, the first with this running everywhere, um, just to be clear, the purpose of this project is not to supplant Docker. There's plenty of workloads that work better in Docker and honestly wouldn't be worth the effort to port them to WASM, even if the WASM and WASI stuff all was in place. Um, but if we're being completely honest with ourselves and, and just blunt, as much as we say Docker is work anywhere, it really isn't. Um, it's just a Linux technology. And yes, people at Microsoft have, have done some very awesome work for enabling Windows containers but they aren't really the same as a Linux container. You can't run an Nginx container that's built on Alpine on, um, on a window, an actual window as a Windows container. You're still running in a VM somewhere. And it's the same thing if you run Docker for Mac, you're, you're running it in a, in a lightweight VM somewhere. Um, so it's not actually run everywhere, whereas Wasm um, has the ability to actually run everywhere. The same compiled module will run on every single system. And I will actually show an example of that in my demo. Um, the other thing here is that it's a smaller footprint for embedded devices. So one of the big stories if people are looking at how do we connect these quote unquote edge devices into Kubernetes and kind of leverage the API and scheduling capabilities. And these, these embedded devices, embedded device scenarios are becoming more and more common. So a WASM module has very little overhead and can run with a much smaller footprint than a container can. Generally they're smaller than containers um, and they, but they can also like run, like I was saying before, a lot of them all at once. Um, and you're not putting the overhead of having a Docker runtime or, or other things that are going um, on at the same time. So for resource constraint and embedded devices, it's a good, uh, it's a really good fit. So there's still support in progress for, for fully supporting ARM devices. We're, we're almost there um, in, the, in the WASM community, but this is one of the other big reasons we have Cresla because we imagine this becoming a more and more common scenario and WASM, being a very good possibility and target for those devices. So that is the kind of high level overview. I know there is lots of info there, but it's really important to understand like everything that was around it because people, they come in with the question. Then once we give them that context, they're like, okay, now it makes sense why you're doing what you're doing. So now that we've enjoyed that view, let's go ahead and see the rest of the ship, which is what you're here for. Like, let's see what Cresslet is. So um, we're going to, um, go ahead and talk about like why, why we're doing, I mean, talk about Cresslet, how it works, um, and about the different runtimes and things that we have supported. So Cresslet is a new project that we released uh, in the beginning of April. It is experimental. It's not meant for production use uh, because WASI is still not totally ready, um, nor is the project, but um, it's functional and I'll go over what's there and what isn't. But the first thing is the name comes from Kubernetes Rust Kubelet. I know that looks a little ugly, but that explains where the name is coming from. It's just kind of a fun name that we chose as we looked into it. So its primary purpose as, we're, as we create things is to run WASM mo modules within Kubernetes. However, we created it in a way that it is an actual Rust crate that you can import. A crate is the name for a package in Rust if you're not familiar. And then you can write a kubelet for anything else in Rust. So that's a secondary purpose that was just a, an extra benefit, but its primary purpose has been to enable these, these WASM modules. Um, we also stole this idea of providers from virtual kubelet, like I mentioned. Um, they're, they're basically implementation, implementations of a runtime that can be used by the kubelet. So um, its two main targets are just going to be WASM and Rust. That's what our first, first providers are. And what I mean by Rust being a target is that there could be really good reasons to write a Kubernetes thing, especially a provider in Rust, which I'll talk a lot more in depth later about that. So what are the features? This is the, uh, this is the slide I'm kind of titling. Let's be clear that this is a very new project still. So you know what you're getting yourself into. So what is there? Um, we have basic pod life cycles. So that means it will spin up, it'll, it'll pull down images and then it'll update the status to say that it's running. Um, and then when you, if it crashes, it'll report an error, but um, we don't have every single condition yet. The other thing here is that we have the downward API support and environment variables. Um, including mounting them from secrets and config maps. And then we have host path secret and config map volumes. We don't support all the cloud volume providers yet because that's just probably a, a little bit further down the road. We're just trying to make sure we get everything working. Now, what isn't there? Um, there's no full ARM support yet. So ARM support is in the underlying library that we use kind of partially. 
but we're, we're working on that so we can get it. Now, Windows can work, but there's some tweaks around dependencies and open SSL and other things that we're trying to work through to make it an actual build process that we support. Um, I'll actually be showing a Windows node today with that. Um, there's no init container support yet. And like I said, no cloud provider volume types, and we're still missing eventing. So there's nothing that gets sent out to the event log and we're not implementing every single pod condition. So that's, like I said, it's functional, but there's still not the full functionality you'd expect from every single detailed status of, of a normal Kubernetes pod. So let's go over what, are, what the providers are. So we have two different providers that we support um, and we're always looking for any other providers. But the, the first one is WASC. So WASC is a project that's come out of Capital One. We've been collaborating with them um, on, on the work around it. It has an actor model where each component uh, performs a specific action. So various parts of the functionality are provided using as a capability is what they're called. And those things add uh, features like streaming file storage, logging, networking, um, et cetera, all those, all those kind of components. So these components and actors can actually be hot swapped without reconfiguring the system. So if you want to um, switch out the logging provider you're using, you can switch that out and all the, uh, you don't have to reconfigure all the rest of the actors. Um, so that's a, a very, very helpful thing. So this, the good thing about WASC is that it has network support right now. It's enabled using these um, capabilities. So like I mentioned, the WASI spec doesn't have networking finalized, but with the capability model that WASC provides, it allows you to, um, provide the behavior from the host. So the host provider is actually providing the behavior of the networking support. It isn't something that's coming from WASM. So it's kind of a, a workaround in that sense. Um, the other thing that we really love about WASC is that it's a strong security model that's on top of normal WASM modules. So we can actually store um, WASM modules in container registries right now. We actually do that in Azure Container Registry. And if you're running your own um, Docker distribution, Docker uh, Hub, that can also support it. Um, and so you can pull from there, but in, in, on top of the security that that provides, you also have this um, neat, you have to have everything signed by a JSON web token that validates that they're actually allowed to run. So you can't just inject the random module in because it will get rejected. Um, just in general, WASC can do even more outside of Kubernetes. You just have to understand that it's gonna require you to buy into the ecosystem. Um, it's a different application design than a, a normal Kubernetes, a traditional Kubernetes runtime. Um, and you'll have to adopt the tooling and things around WASC to, to fully embrace it um, outside of Kubernetes or even with, uh, even with Kubernetes. So that's the WASC provider. The WASI provider, um, the main goal here is that we're following the WASI standard using a tool called WASM time. Um, we aren't bolting anything else on top of this. So that's why there's no networking, which is the other thing to be aware of. We're tracking it closely and we're gonna add that all in when it comes in. And like, again, this is where I mentioned, this is really new. Uh, the last thing here is that it's more of a traditional container and I use that in big air quotes because it isn't actually a Docker container, but it's more of the traditional container model of execution. So WASC is a complete runtime with an underlying actor host, but WASI, each module is, is its own little process, its own thing that's running and doing its own thing. So it's more like a traditional container in that sense. Um, like I said before, we're always looking for people to write other providers, WASM related or otherwise. So if you wanted to write one for some other runtime system, we'd love to see that. Um, and you can just let us know about it. Quick, quick question. Yeah. So if the WASM provider doesn't have any networking, then what can you actually use it for? Right now we're, we're using it. Um, I'm going to be writing this demo soon, but we're going to be writing like a batch processing. So we're going to pass data into a volume, mount the volume crunch the data and then use the WASC side um, to pull out the data with an HTTP request. Um, it's still very new and that's the problem. We know that we know there's no networking. So it's good for batch processing, but not, not so good for some of like the, I wanna run a server kind of thing right now. Any other questions? Uh, you were saying about WASM time that the, it is more of a traditional container model. Mm -hmm. um, uh, full disclosure, I'm on the WASM time team. Um, yeah. I uh, actually um, wouldn't consider it to be the traditional container model. Uh, and so I'd be interested in hearing more about um, the, the reason why you would think 
why you think that that is the case. Yeah, so I'm not saying it's relatable like one-to-one -one with a container. It's more of compared to WASC, it is more close to what we traditionally think of as containers in Kubernetes. It isn't in any way similar in like a, that compared to an actual Docker container. Um, there, that's not the comparison. This is more the comparison between the WASI provider and the WASC provider, because we know WASM time is completely different, does not run like a normal container or anything like that. It's just more in the actual how it executes and what's going on behind the scenes. It's more of the traditional, I have a, a thing that's running that I could call a container inside of Kubernetes. Does that clarify it? Um, we can follow up later, I think. Um, uh, one other thing I wanted to note is that both WASI and WASC are actually capabilities based. Um, WASI uh, is also capabilities based. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and go on to some, some demoing. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about what, what it is and like what's going on here, but I'm going to show this actually in action. So let's go ahead and bring up um, these demos. So right now I'm pointing, I have an AKS cluster that's running just with a, a single normal Kubernetes node, but then I have attached um, two nodes to it. So I've attached this computer I'm presenting on, which is a Mac, and then I've uh, um, attached a uh, Windows machine that I have out in the other room behind me um, to this cluster as well. And so we're running on a, on a Mac, a, window, a Mac and a Windows machine right here with these examples. So before I run, I just wanted to show what this code looks like. So we, we have some simple demos inside of our um, inside of our uh, repo. So if you look in these demos, we'll actually go to the WASI ones right now. And so we have a couple different examples. We have one in assembly script, one in C, and one in Rust. Um, and so what's nice about WASM is um, there's still only support for a few languages for WASI, but you can write it in any language and compile it just like you would with with any other language. Um, so Rust, if you look at it, we're actually writing a Rust project. We have a thing running here and we're, we're printing things out to standard out and standard error. We're um, looping through the environment variables that we have set in the container and printing those. And then we're, we're printing any arguments that have come in. And so we were able to do this in various languages, like right here, the three, the, the three main ones that are kind of the best support right now. And we have C, and we, we can look at there, we have the same kind of idea that decides to load. Here we go. And so you can see we're, we're printing to standard error, standard out, we're reading from the environment, and we're printing out the, the arguments. Um, and so we're doing that in, in various languages. So these are all compiled into modules and pushed into, um, pushed into uh, uh, Azure Container Registry. So um, if we look at the examples in each of these, we have this um, Kubernetes definition, just like a normal pod you would see anywhere else. It has the, the reference to the uh, module, and then it has the different variables we're setting from config maps and from downward APIs. And then we're, we're scheduling it. We have to give it a toleration that it should run on one of these nodes. So um, with that understanding, let's go ahead and, uh, and try these. So we're going to go ahead and apply the C demo, and we'll see where it gets scheduled. So That'll get created. Okay, and we can see that it's running on my Mac. Um, it exited because it was just a, a simple process, and we can actually go get the logs from that. Oh, sorry. And so those came from from the uh, from my Mac right here. So those came in. So now let's try um, running another one. So I'm going to run. Um, the Rust one, and I'm going to run it against uh, Windows. So I'm just going to make sure that it uses a node selector um, to, to do that. So I'm just changing it on the other screen right here so we can see it show up on Windows. And so we'll see this one's running on the Windows machine, um, running Rust. And so now if I get the logs for that one, we'll see that it also will pull those from my Windows machine and, and pull them back. 
Um, and so the thing is, is these can run on, on any of the systems. So I could delete, um, I'm going to go ahead and do, a delete. And then I'm going to go ahead and change it so that it will uh, schedule over to um, the Windows one just to show that it will work. So let's go ahead and apply that again. And so now we see that it's running on Windows and we can get the logs again. and it is able to run on there. So this leads to some really awesome portability in between the different um, operating systems. And we didn't have to recompile. We didn't have to, these are, this is all the same module. Um, I think actually most of these modules I compiled on my machine here and they can run here. They can run on the Windows machine. They can run on a Linux machine. And like I said, we're working on ARM support. So this is all, you can do this with all, all the three main things of code that are supported right now are C, REST and assembly script, but there's more that are coming. And then you can just compile them just like you would any other project. So any questions about the demo? You can ask questions in chat if you don't want to unmute. Yeah, what does actually building the quote unquote container look like? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Here, let me go ahead and show that. So I actually have instructions in each of these. Um, it comes with the pre-built module if you want to. Um, with Rust, it's probably the most simple. You just add a build target to your, to your Rust installation. And then all I have to do is cargo build target WASM32 WASI and then release. And we have instructions on using a tool called WASM to OCI that um, allows you to push. And so you'll, you basically can download that tool and then it's as simple as doing and this right here, I say WASM to OCI push my WASM module that I created to whatever container registry that you've created. Um, so the build process is fairly simple for Rust and um, fairly simple for uh, assembly script as well. C is a little bit more difficult. They have a, an SDK for it that's basically a custom configured version of Clang and, and the whole compiler uh, tool set right there. Um, you don't have to use it, but it shows there's a custom SDK that you can use to download, put it in place, um, and then build it. And once you have that in place, it's actually pretty much just as simple. You give it the, the C file, you tell it where your sysroot is compiling from, and you output it to a WASM file, and then you can push it. Cool. So, um, Bravi asked, do you have any plans to do benchmarks? Uh, yes, we will get to that right now. We're just still so new that we haven't like done all the benchmarking. I know that the WASC project has done a lot of benchmarking, at least internally. I'm not sure if they've released it. Um, and it depends on what you're looking for. But I know that like the, um, the load times and, and other things like that and the, like the cold start is actually pretty fast for, um, for WASM. So um, we haven't done it ourselves, though, so I can't give you a good, a good number on that. But we do plan on doing that once we stabilize things a bit more. Okay, and I have a question of my own um, yeah. that probably means that I missed something um, uh, while I was checking. Um, can I just run a regular OCI container using Crustlet? Right now, no. It's, okay. um, we don't have a provider for that right now, but somebody could write one. We have started writing, um, at least for the polling side of things, you'll see in our crates, and we'll be pushing this crate out soon. We've created OCI distribution, which is going to be a Rust implementation of the distribution specification. Um, but we don't have anything that actually like runs uh, containers. So we don't have that yet. Um, we, like I said, our main focus for this first thing has been around WASM, but we've, we've created the, the crustlet, the cubelet logic that we've created can be used for anything that implements provider, which I'll kind of explain um, a little bit more. But basically all you have to do is implement a specific trait um, which is kind of like an interface in um, Go. And that trait is this right here. It's a provider. As long as you okay. implement that, you can, um, you can make it run anything you want it to. Okay, so I would need to, but if I implemented, if I implement a provider for say cryo, then it would work. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it would work. Any other questions? 
so basically like uh, like have you configured on this like uh, on the windows or like the mac machine like does it does it uh, does it have any dependencies like how, how do Sorry, I lost the last part of your question. Yeah, so uh, the the question is like, uh, how how does the configuration like uh, uh, vary between like the the Windows machine on the Mac? So does it does it same or like is it is it different? No, so it's actually it's actually not different. Like I said, the only thing right now that's kind of weird is we have the Open SSL dependency, um, and we're trying to figure out a way to work around that and make it so we can. Do it anywhere, but if you, um, if we look at the actual binary, um, you'll see that this is this is the same configuration on on both machines. So like I just have to give it like an address to listen on to, the node name, where my certificate's at. Um, those are the kinds of things. There's no separate configurations. I didn't have to run it in a VM. It's just running in a PowerShell uh, window I have open on on my Windows machine. Anything else? Uh, yeah, there's a question from chat, Austin. Uh, given that you're using the Kubernetes pod API, does that imply that you get support for cron jobs, daemon sets, et cetera, for free when implementing providers? Yes, you do. So we're just scheduling the pods and you can spin it up with a deployment. You can spin it up with whatever. Um, and uh, we'll, like I said, we'll have some more examples of that soon in our demos repository, but you will get everything for free because it is implementing the pod API. So as long as it's creating a pod, it'll pick everything up. Okay. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and continue. Feel free to ask any more questions. So let's go ahead and go into what I'm calling the engine room. This is the kind of nitty gritty stuff with how this ship is actually working. Um, mainly we're gonna be talking about why we, like about how we were using Rust for writing Kubernetes applications and what we learned by doing Crestlet in Rust. So let's start off with that, that big question. Well, why Rust? Why did you do that? Like this is one of the first questions we always get because people are always like, why do Rust when your team has a background in Go and all the most fully featured li libraries for Kubernetes are in Go? So these right here are the top uh, four reasons why we chose Rust. The first two I can just explain now, they're relatively simple, but the last two I'm gonna dig into a bit more. Um, the first thing is that Rust has great Wasm and Wasi support. Um, it's like, like I showed with that example, all you have to do is add a simple target and then you can build stuff for, for Wasi. Um, and because of this kind of top level and uh, top level support for um, Wasi builds inside of Rust, um, a lot of the tooling around it is also built in Rust. So Wasm time is built in Rust. Um, a lot of the other Wasm runtimes that are out there right now also are built in Rust. And so that made a, it a good reason to choose Rust because we could just embed those in without any finagling or trying to do an FFI out to other code. So um, that, was, that was probably um, the easy, one of the big decisions right there is from that Wasi support. The second is around safety. Um, so one of the big features of Rust is its safety, and I kind of will mention this as we, as I, as I go down into these other points. But it it has a lot of type safety and um, concurrency guarantees and um, correctness, code correctness. Um, this is this is the kind of thing that prevents uh, bugs from happening. Um, we had an example with uh, with Helm actually recently where we discovered a race condition that had been in there for about a year. Um, that we had completely passed the, the race check when we were doing our Go testing. Um, and that kind of error, you can't even get past the compiler in Rust. And so it introduces a bunch of safety guarantees that are, are very handy and you can only be unsafe by explicitly calling it out in code. Um, so you know where your unsafe uh, things are where you could get like null pointers. There's no way to get a null pointer um, exception. Um, those are the kinds of things that, that Rust brings to the table. So, um, it, 
it does this through something called a borrowing and ownership. And so like you have something called the borrow checker that makes sure that you always have data. And if you try to do something like send data that you've already used or sent to another thread, it's going to tell you you can't do it because now that data has been owned by another, another thread or another process. So let's go ahead and dive into these last two points, which is extensibility. Um, and so with this first one, the extensibility, this is, I know it's a big wall of text. So one of the things that we absolutely loved about Rust uh, were its generics and uh, its powerful trait system. So traits are the ability to define shared behavior, behavior in an abstract way, and then you can bind generic parameters to that behavior. Um, they're, they're similar to Go interfaces, but used in different ways. So it allows us to do something like creating a custom type that can allow us to handle any Kubernetes um, object. And so if you look here on the left, this is the Rust version of, of getting a like client.corev1.pods um, to, to get a client for that. And so what you do is you're actually just specifying um, a pod um, type. So you're giving it the pod type um, in, in it as a generic parameter and I'm, and I'm getting a namespace client for that. And you can see it's the same for every kind of, um, of client. And the implementation is just right there. It's just saying, I can be an API for anything that um, is bound to this resource trait, um, which is what all Kubernetes types implement inside of Rust. Um, and so this allows for some really interesting things as you go around because you have all these duplicated interfaces in Go. You have pods and secrets. And if you see like most of these overlap, they do the same things. They're gonna make the same calls to the API, just doing a, a different URL. And so if I want to, um, if I want to handle something that could handle any, any sort of type inside of uh, Rust, it's pretty easy. I just pass in whatever types I, I want and I can just use this generic client. Whereas with Go, I have to accept a specific type of pod interface or implement the whole pod interface or implement the, implement the whole secret interface or implement the whole client set interface. Um, and so it's really hard to do that. The, this Rust version is much more extensible and easy to use as we embed it inside of other things. Um, another example of this, um, so th this is gonna be a little bit more absurd because I know you wouldn't do this exactly this way and go, but just as a comparison, so this is a, a function we actually have inside of Crustlet that gives us a human readable key, um, unique key for a pod um, when we are, when we're storing it in internal memory. And so um, this pod key has this cool trait called as ref. And so what, what it allows you to do is pass in anything that can be referred to as a string. So it can be a path. Um, you, you could, if we wanted to pass in a file path, you can pass in a bare string, you can pass in a specific path type that has all the checking built in. Um, and then we format it and put it out. So we can still have concrete types here. So when I pass it in, I'm still passing in a specific concrete type. I'm not passing in an interface. I'm passing in a string or I'm passing in what's called a path buff. Um, all these are, are concrete. They're not a dynamic dispatch. So when you contrast this with Go, um, it becomes a bit more messy. Now, I, I know here, I've written tons of Go. I know we could just use the, the format functions. Um, but what if this function wasn't just formatting a string? And what if we were dealing with other types here? So in this case, I would have to accept an interface, which is the stringer or whatever I've defined. And then I have to check that that interface is not nil, which means there's error handling. And then I, then I can do my actions with it. Um, so if we take it even more absurd, which once again, I know this is absurd, but um, what if we wanted to uh, write something that accepted both a bare string and anything that implements stringer? Um, but like, once again, imagine if these were non-string types that we wanted to support. We're, we're still having to check for nil. We have to type assert um, and then handle the errors there and so on and so on for each of the parameters before we actually do what we're, do what we're trying to do. Whereas if you look at that top example from, from Rust, it's just, I, I've given it the specific trait. I still have concrete types and I handle it in and there's no extra error handling or checking for nil or anything like that. If that's not enough, here's an example of a CRD. So um, there's, been a lot of big strides made in libraries for writing CRDs and controllers. Um, you can still use the bare like code generator and whatnot, but this is pretty much all that's required in your code to be able to do a custom type. So you, there's these wonderful things, which I'll explain more about, um, but there are um, these derived things which just add code for you automatically. That's a kind of a meta, meta programming code generation thing that will make sure it derives a custom resource, allows it to be serializable, and then I've given it a specification for what the API group is. 
And so then I can use it just like before in that bottom example where I, I specify that foo type inside of my API and I can pull in and, and interact with those foo types without a problem. Um, because of this generic nature, I mean, that is, there's way less extra code out there. There's not these big gobs of code or code generators you have to run. It's super simple and super clean. This is way simpler than trying to do a CRD and control a CRD with a controller in, in Go. So that's the example of the extensibility. Um, the next thing is around developer experience. So the first thing of the developer experience is around dependency management. And I have to confess, just to start this off, I absolutely love Cargo. It's, I am in love with it. Um, Cargo is the package and build manager for Rust. Um, it isn't actually a requirement to use, but pretty much everybody uses it. Um, and now as someone who's developed many large projects against the Kubernetes libraries and API um, in Go, I can just tell you it's an absolute nightmare to upgrade or add any library dependency. Um, several of them have different versioning schemes like client Go, and then you have to figure out specific hashes or branches to get everything to compile, especially when you have more dependencies. Um, just take a look at the, the Helm Go mod file to, to get an example of that. In Cargo, it's just as simple as this top thing I have right here. Um, I'm specifying that I want the kube client and I want the open API types of version 1.17. So this actually shows a great example of something called features as well. Um, these are conditional compilation directives that allow you to specify only part of a package. So you don't end up, end up having to build in a whole dependency. You only have to build what you need. So we actually do this inside of Crestlet um, to make sure you don't pull in a flag parsing library unless you really want to. So we have this um, ops struct that, that specifies our command line flags. And if you have specified that you want the CLI feature or if we're building docs, then it will pull in these, this ops and um, allow you to, um, it will pull in the ops and then we'll pull in the dependency for it because we also have the conditional dependency in our dependency management. So with that and combined with some other cool features that it has like specifying local patches to use and then also support for multiple crates or multiple packages within a repository um, is, is quite awesome. We, we really enjoy it. So the next thing is around the ease of coding. So like I had mentioned before, we have this idea of, of macros and metaprogramming. Um, and then we have some of how error handling works and then flow control. So I'm just gonna show some quick examples of this. I wanna save some time for a question, so I'm gonna um, skip over some of it, but let's go over what, what this looks like. So let's go back to the code and look. So inside of our, <clears throat> um, so right here we have multiple crates. These are all entirely separate packages um, that can be coexisting fairly easily together. Um, we have these, these idea of macros and, and metaprogramming. So I already showed you the one with the right, but we also have these really cool things that you can do inside of um, creating like Kubernetes resources. So this is a macro that's defined by CERD, which is a, a serialization and deserialization library for Rust. Um, it's kind of like the de facto standard that most people use. Um, you can actually specify uh, JSON while interpolating in whatever types of, of uh, values. So this one's a string, but I can specify an array of bytes. I can specify whatever thing I want. This is a timestamp. Um, it's an actual like time object inside of Rust. Um, we can pass in different IP addresses, which this is an actual like IP address struct, um, and it knows how to serialize everything properly. Um, you can use these values to then, um, when you're creating stuff in the node um, fairly uh, quickly. So right up here when we do, Sorry, that's not, here we are. So if we're gonna say um, node definition, we're gonna try to create a node right here on this line. And this, um, all that we have to do is we pull this node definition that we got that's kind of this intermediate value and I can pass it in. Because of the generics I mentioned before, you can actually pass in a raw string, you can pass in this JSON value type that we created, or you can serialize it to a specific um, internal like type representation for like the pod or the node or whatever it might be. And so these macros can, can allow you to do some really interesting things and you see them all over the place in Rust. So like this is for error logging and um, it's code generation allows you to do some really, really cool and interesting things. So um, the other nice thing is around error handling. Oops, not too far up. Um, if we look at, at error handling and control flow, um, 
there's some just really helpful things. Now, obviously some of these are personal preference, but we found that a lot of these made code easier to, to reason with and to understand. Um, but the error handling is really nice because you always have to, to handle it in some way. And so you'll see a lot of these different tasks inside of these different things, um, like while let sum. So you can say let sum is saying anytime I receive some sort of, uh, of response from this and you have to unwrap it. There's also things with, um, I can find it because I have lost it apparently. Um, yeah, apparently I lost it, but um, it's actually back here in Node. Um, inside of Node, you can see when we're, we're matching. So we're, we're trying to match on this create. And if we get an okay response, so it has this thing called the result. If we get an okay, it contains the type that we're expecting and we, we can unwrap that automatically in these match blocks or we handle the error and we can unwrap that error even um, further. So there's some really interesting unwrapping things that I can't like dive into right now um, and how we handle errors that just make it very clear because you always have to handle the errors that come back to you. Um, and there's no way to get a nil from that because you either get the response or you get the error from it. So like with anything, there's always caveats. Um, something to note if you're going to be trying something with Rust and Kubernetes is that the Rust Kubernetes client library is lacking some of the advanced um, Go library features. And that's things like building a patch, building from a stream of manifests, those kind of more advanced features that you'll do that you've probably used if you built something bigger for Kubernetes. And some of those will probably be missing for the next little while as, as they're trying to get more feature parity. Um, the other thing to know about is async runtime. So async runtimes are the way you do any of your asynchronous or concurrent programming. Um, and there's still a bit of a mess in Rust. There's currently two different options and the whole community is kind of split between which one they're using. Um, they're called Tokyo and async standard and they kind of have different trade-offs and different problems for each one. Um, the documentation, um, especially examples around them can be a bit lacking, um, but Go already has excellent and easy to use concurrency primitives right now. Everyone knows how to use Go routines and channels and, and those kind of things that are just built in. Um, the other thing that we always like to know is the, what we like to call the logarithmic learning curve. It has a very steep initial learning curve to get into Rust um, because Rust is not the first language to introduce the concept of ownership or borrowing, but it's probably one of the more popular. And a lot of people probably haven't done a lot with a language that has this ownership concept. And getting and you, you spend the first couple of weeks fighting with the compiler and trying to understand how all these things work. But once you get over about three to four weeks um, of constant development, that's like 100% time, um, you're, you generally get over that curve and you're able to start um, contributing good, good code and fighting less with the compiler. So those are the caveats. Um, before we go to questions, if you're ever interested in helping or any questions, uh, here's a link to the project. We're looking for documentation for GKE. DigitalOcean, IBM, any provider, um, feedback on any issues. You can try things out and file bugs and things that you find. You can join in our weekly call. Um, if you're good at Rust, um, you can help us refactor. And then if, you're, if ARM and compiler stuff around ARM interests you, that could be something where you can get in, um, involved in the greater community with WASM time and, and other things that, ha that, were, that have efforts around getting better ARM support. So with that said, are there any questions? Um, Andrew wants to know, so is the next move to rebuild the Kubernetes API in Rust? <laughs> um, I don't personally have an opinion on that. If somebody wanted to try it, it'd be really cool. Um, we, we were just focused mostly on, on this. Like I said, the generics and how you can handle like multiple different but very similar types, like what we get in Kubernetes all the time was very, very helpful. So I imagine it could help clean things up and make things a little bit easier to, to do. But I mean, I haven't really worked directly on the Kubernetes API, so I couldn't tell you for sure if that would be a good idea, but it's not out of the question for somebody to try. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, I'll be sending out these slides if anyone has it. Here's some reference of links to the project, links to WASC, um, some high level overview stuff, intro blogs, things on why we did Kubernetes and Rust. Um, these are just some useful links that you, that you can use if you're interested in finding out more. I have a, I have a quick question, um, Taylor. In your uh, list of things, you had some great ideas for people who wanted to jump in and help. 
And I noticed that you say, try it out, file bugs. Can you give people a pointer to what direction will they find the most exciting bugs? Um, I'm sure you will probably find some interesting bugs if you're trying out some of the more complex deployments or if you're trying to put together just an example application, like what if I was trying to do something in all WASM, like what happens or um, kind, of, kind of stretching those things or um, stretching the, those boundaries of what you're trying to do like inside of like, okay, right now we can prove that we can print stuff out and we can mount volumes, but then what happens when we like try to like do some complex data pipelines where we want to pass some data down or those are the kinds of things that might like stress some of the edges and find out what those bugs are. That appears to be all the questions that we have. Um, so if you want to stop sharing, I'll wrap up. So thank you very much. Um, that was an awesome presentation. Um, this, the recording of this presentation will go up later today on the CNCF, the brand new CNCF Ambassadors channel. Um, uh, later today, hopefully maybe early tomorrow, it is a brand new channel, so we're still setting some things up. Um, uh, again, uh, Cloud Native PDX will have another one of these, this time on networking um, on May 19th. Um, and I, if you want to get involved in Crustlet, follow all of the links that Taylor gave you. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, and have a good day.